Ahead on NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. On this week's special live edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen, animal traceability. Industry experts respond to your questions. NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen Live starts right now. And now, a live edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen with host Kevin Oxner. Hello and welcome to this week's special live edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. I'm Kevin Oxner. Thanks for joining us. We're talking tonight about the new animal disease traceability proposal and what it could mean for our industry. And we're joined by guests from across our country. Let's welcome Bill Donald, president of National Cattlemen's Beef Association and Montana Rancher. Colin Woodall, he's the vice president of government affairs for NCBA. Dan Hallstrom, the senior vice president of global marketing with U U.S. Meat Export Federation. We have Leanne Saunders, the president of IMI Global. And finally, Mark Gustafson, representing the international business with JBS Swift. Folks, thanks so much for joining us on our show tonight. Thank Good you. Thank you. Yeah. And these industry experts are ready to take your calls on the animal disease traceability proposal. Give us a call now at 1-888-824-6688 or email your question to c2c at beef.org. Let's begin by getting some initial thoughts from our panelists. And I guess I'd like to start, first of all, Bill, with you. Give us your perspective on this traceability proposal. Well, there's a couple components here that I think are important. On our ranch, we age and source verify our cattle. That's for marketing purposes. That doesn't have anything to do with this traceback proposal from uh, APHIS. The traceback proposal is about disease traceability. Can we trace animals back that become sick? You know, uh, I live just north of Yellowstone National Park, which is the last reservoir of brucellosis in the country. And we've had outbreaks of brucellosis in all three states surrounding the park. That uh, showed me pretty quickly that it's important that we have some sort of a uh, accurate, detailed traceability mechanism in place. That's what this new uh, ADT is going to do. Very good. Colin, NCBA has been actively engaged in this discussion. What's NCBA's position on this? For several years now, NCBA's members have really debated this whole issue of animal identification and now animal disease traceability. And we've really uh, seen a change in people wanting to adopt this and accept this. But I think the reason why is because it was a real focus on the traceability of diseased animals. The one thing that we were trying to caution people on is that this is not a food safety tool, nor does it really prevent animal disease. It just allows us to better respond. That's, that's a great reminder. Dan, give us your perspective from an international viewpoint. Well, the U.S. Meat Export Federation <clears throat> is involved in the maximizing of the volume and value of beef products globally. And uh, USMEF has a reach out to more than 80 countries around the world. We sell our beef products every year. And one of our, one of our main focuses is uh, focusing on those issues that could increase or decrease the profitability and the value that goes into the beef animal. And traceability is definitely one of those issues that is also an impact on the marketing side as well as the access side. Very good. Leanne, your, customer, or your company provides uh, traceability services and has done that for, for cattlemen for some time. What's your read? You know, we believe strongly in animal identification and traceability systems, and like you said, Kevin, have been involved for the last 16 years in helping the industry put in place these systems, primarily for voluntary market-driven initiatives, whether it's the international markets that Dan alluded to, the systems that Bill talked about. It's putting in place those systems needed to, prevert, to, to preserve certain traits all the way through the supply system. I think it's a very complex issue for the industry, and when we're talking about ADT, as Bill said, that's specific to disease traceability. And then when you're talking about it from a marketing perspective, there's, there's needs on that side as well. So it's very complex for our industry. Very good. We'll look forward to some more discussion about that. From your perspective, Mark, you, you sell beef to retail and food service customers around the globe. What's your read? Well, you know, the traceability uh, programs have been around for a long time. And, and most every market we sell into has some traceability program. A lot of our competition has traceability programs. And I think it's, it's important to differentiate between the uh, food safety aspect and the animal health aspect and the commercial aspect. And in foreign markets, uh, traceability is, is something that's required. Uh, 
Some countries, most customers want it, most customers ask for it, and so it's something that the industry in the United States has to deal with. We've already prompted some questions on my behalf, and we're excited to take questions about traceability from you. Give us a call at 1-888-824-6688, or you can email us at c 2 c at beef.org. Now, also tonight, I'm asking you to join me and thousands of other cattlemen and women across the United States as a member of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. And right now, reporter Kendall Frazier is learning more about what that means. Hey there, Kendall. Hey, thank you, Kevin. I'm with Forrest Roberts, who's the CEO of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. Forrest, what is the pulse of the industry? Well, Kendall, 2011 is going to go down as a year in the beef industry here in the United States as one of absolute change. When we think about the change that's been brought about to this industry from Mother Nature, just in it by itself, you look at weather patterns across the country that have had rain for some people and no rain at all for others. So it's led to record high cattle prices across the entire industry. So a, a year of change has been the best way we would describe 2011 for the beef industry. Now, NCBA has had some big wins this year. What are some of those highlights? Sure, we're going to have a wrap-up here of 2011. We're going to be able to reflect back on some major outcomes for this industry. And first, if you think about a project that we launched here in 2011 that really is going to be able to measure the footprint of the U.S. beef industry when we look at the environmental impacts, the economic impacts, and the societal impacts, that's an area where we would consider to be a lot of excitement. Secondly, when we think about our consumers, being able to cut through the consumer clutter that they're bombarded with every day, we've got some research that we're bringing forward that we're very excited about that will change that paradigm of beef causes heart disease back to the point of beef is a part of a heart healthy diet. And when you think about what Colin and his team does in Washington, D.C., they've had some major wins this year, starting with death tax about uh, the early part of the year and pushing back on that legislation all the way through to a rule a rule that would have taken away the value that our industry has created over 20 years called the gypsy rule. We pushed back on that as well. And then just here in the last couple of weeks, uh, pushing back on EPA and how they're wanting to regulate farm dust for producers all across this country. But perhaps one of them that we're most importantly uh, and focused on here and proud of is how we've worked with our state partners at the state affiliate level and the state beef council levels to really tell the story about what farmers and ranchers do to produce beef all across this country through the Cattlemen Stewardship Report. It really kind of gives a view of what this industry is really all about. So we're really excited about some of the outcomes here in 2011. For all those cattlemen watching our program tonight, why should they join NCBA? That's a great question, Kendall. NCBA is the oldest, largest national cattlemen's organization representing interests for cattlemen and women across this country 365 days a year. So we want everyone watching this program tonight to become a member of NCBA because we're the only organization that is focused on growing demand for their product, beef. Secondly, trying to gain access to a lot of these key export markets around the globe. And then last but not least, we're working every day in Washington, D.C. to give them a business environment where they can be profitable. In other words, how do we give these producers freedom to operate in a responsible way? That's why we need every single person watching this program tonight to become a member of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. Thank you, Forrest Roberts, the CEO of NCBA. And we would encourage everyone watching tonight to pick up the phone and call and become a member of NCBA. Back to you, Kevin. Well, thank you, Kendall and Forrest. And you can join the National Cattlemen's Beef Association tonight. There's some great incentives from Beringer Ingelheim Vet Medica, Roper Stetson, and some of our other corporate partners. Give us a call now at 1-866-USA-BEEF or visit us at beefusa.org. Let's return to the topic at hand, the animal disease traceability proposal. Cattleman to Cattleman reporter Brian Baxter recently had a chance to visit one Texas cattle operation that has a long-standing traceability program already in place. We're primarily a stalker cattle operation. We do have a set of backgrounding pens. We may, we may feed some cattle in these pens from time to time. We don't do it much anymore. At one time, we did have a cow herd of registered Gelvie and Red Angus. Uh, however, we're down to about, from about 200 cows to about 24 cows because of the drought. Uh, we'll, and we'll probably pare those down again before it's, before it's said and done. Like other ranchers in the Texas Panhandle, Jay Johnson is dealing with extreme drought. But he believes in taking the long view when it comes to his operation and not just about the weather. He's had an animal traceability program in place for about 10 years now. The way I define animal traceability is my ability to know where, a, where an animal came from. So for us, it, what, 
maybe what ranch it came from or what cell barn it came from. And then as it passes through us and then on to the feed yard and then on to the packing house. So tracing every, I guess tracing every stop that animal makes in its life. Jay started an animal traceability program for economic reasons to add value to his cattle. We probably started handling age and source cattle about four years ago. And then it's evolved into buying or having, we still have a few cows around maybe that we did uh, the non-hormone treated cattle, the NHTC cattle, that, that meat would be eligible to export to Europe. But he says there are other reasons why animal traceability is important. First one is from a disease standpoint. It, you know, it's probably not if, but when we finally do have a disease outbreak that's, that could be uh, damaging to the industry, knowing where that animal has been along its lifetime, you know, if we can trace back and limit the damage to our industry, I think that's important. You know, I think the other part of that is, is our consumer wants to know more about the product that we're raising. They're not ever going to understand the full process, but if they can understand, you know, the life cycle of that animal and how we handle and treat our animals, I think we're, we're better off with our consumer than, than them not knowing. And given that other countries are now demanding meat traceability programs, Jay believes a national program is inevitable in the U.S. and to not have one could harm America's beef exports. But it's a stumbling block is going to be traceability. It's just something, whether it's, whether it's true or not, it's, a, it's something that our competitors can say, we, ha like, we have it, the U.S. doesn't, you need to trade with us. And so it's something that a China or a Korea or whoever can say, you know, y'all really need to have that before we're going to open any more access to our markets. Jay created his own traceability program. He says the technology involved using button ID tags, computer software, and an electronic wand has come a long way from where it was a decade ago. He estimates the program costs about $2 per head, but says it's a long-term investment. If we learn how to utilize that data, then that, that, that two bucks is cheap. Because if it keeps me from buying a set of calves that don't work, or if it helps me market a set of animals, that I can say, all right, yeah, I put that $2 tag in them so I have this information. And, some, and a feed yard says, well, that's worth $3, then I'm a dollar ahead. You know, I think that's the way I look at it. It's an opportunity for me to add value. Jay's family has been ranching in the Panhandle for nearly a century. He intends to take his operation forward with programs like animal traceability, and he recommends cattle men and women learn about it now. At least investigate it and learn about it, what you can, and how it would apply to your operation, because don't let it sneak up on you and one day the government say, all right, Next time you ship cattle from Montana to Texas, we don't care what size they are, you've got to have documentation to trace those animals from point A to point B. But don't be afraid to at least explore the opportunity for change. It may not fit your operation. And if it doesn't, you don't have to do it. But if you don't explore and keep trying to find a better way, not necessarily a newer way, but a better way to improve your operation, you're not ever going to grow. Reporting from Happy, Texas, I'm Brian Baxter for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. And we're taking your questions live. Give us a call now at 1-888-824-6688 to ask our panel of experts about traceability or email us at c2c at beef.org. Well, let's get right to our first caller. We've got Joanne calling from Nebraska. Joanne, thanks for calling. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks for having me on. You bet. I wonder if somebody could tell me what exactly is traceability and how it affects me directly as a cow-calf producer. Okay. You know, that's a great question. And, Bill, maybe I, I start with you, maybe several of you that, that like to follow up. But define traceability. So much confusion around this issue. Well, traceability, as it applies to this uh, animal disease traceability program that is being implemented by APHIS, has to do with the ability of uh, our government and our state veterinarians to track an animal back to its uh, herd of origin. You know, uh, if we have some contagious diseases, health officials are going to need to know what other animals were exposed. So we need something in place for, and this is the mechanism that APHIS is using, to get 
the traceability from the ranch of origin through the feedlot and up to the packing plant and back down. So if we find a disease somewhere, we can track it back. But you're speaking specifically of animal health traceability. That's right. And you you spent most of your career working on another side of the traceability issue. Is that right? Yes. When you look at traceability, because of the complexity, you have to look at three components to traceability. I always talk to folks about which is the breadth of the traceability system, the depth, and the precision. And that could be different depending on specific market demands or in customer demands from a voluntary value added perspective. Breadth means how much information are we going to collect on that particular animal or group of animals as they move through the chain. Depth means how far forward and how far back do we go. And precision means the accuracy of the information that we have to move forward. And then also now you have another level required by some markets, which is verification. So from a cow-calf producer's perspective, when you look at these value-added programs, you have to understand what the standard is and then how you meet those specific requirements of a given market today. Very good. Pete is calling us from Texas. Pete, go ahead with your question. Hi, this is Pete Bonds. Uh, most of your uh, panelists know me, but uh, <laughs> this is mainly for Mark. How come if the uh, uh, the uh, uh, value uh, for the ex uh, exported cattle are so great. How come we uh, quit getting a premium up in the north and uh, are still getting somewhat of a premium in the south? So the question about premiums and how those fluctuate and so forth, especially given this environment that we're in, uh, that we have such uh, su such uh, uh, exciting export markets. Right, it, it, it's really strictly supply and demand, and, and um, there's there's several programs that that pay premiums. The non hormone treated cattle program pays a premium. The natural program pays a premium. The age and source verified program for Japan pays a premium, and it depends on the the number of cattle in the region and the demand by the packer for those cattle, specifically in Japan. If there's a larger number of cattle available, the, the price will obviously be down. If there's a smaller number of cattle available and there's more packers bidding on those cattle, obviously the price will be up. And, and again, a lot of it's predicated on the packer and what kind of orders he has from Japan and how much demand he has for those types of cattle to pay a premium for. Very good. Kenny's calling us from Colorado. Kenny, go ahead with your question. Thank you, Kevin, for having me on. Yeah. Hey, my question is, I fully support the trace back, but I'm a little curious with this listeria outbreak that we had this fall. I realize that's food safety, but they traced that back to an exact farm, and it was contained. I realize there were some deaths involved. My question is, is there some way to limit liability back to the producer in a catastrophic event like that in case there is a trace back so that the producer doesn't get sued out of business, so to speak? You know, there, this food safety issue is a huge issue, and we, we've seen, you know, obviously what's happened uh, in a cantaloupe issue uh, right here in Colorado. L let me ask you, Mark, to begin with that. You're closest to the consumers. Um, how, how would you respond? Well, that, that's a tough issue because, as we pointed out early on, it, the food safety and traceability components really, really don't, don't mesh. Uh, traceability is, is really about either animal disease or, or specific specifications for those cattle. Uh, when it gets to the packing plant and, and it becomes a pathogen control issue and, and I'm just not sure that, that there's any, any application for traceability when it comes down to food safety. Okay. Jim is, oh did you have a comment? Jim is calling us from Ohio. Jim, uh, thanks for calling. Thanks for having me gentlemen. Yes. I appreciate what you're doing. Uh, I've got a two-part question. Number one, the thing that probably bothers me as a small producer uh, the most is not being able to utilize state inspected facilities and being able to market, uh, direct market, on a multi-state basis. Whereas, you know, when we look in the grocery stores and uh, we have foreign products coming in from all over the, the world that are marketed in the Walmarts and the Kroger's and whatnot. And uh, I really doubt if the foreign uh, processors are near as good as our state inspected processors. So what's the association doing to try to get that part of the paradigm fixed? Very good. Colin, why don't you take a crack at that? You know, somebody that wants to take animals to a state inspected mm -hmm. facility and be able to sell them, you know, across state lines and so forth, where does the organization stand on that? 
Well, that is a great question. It's been a huge issue for us for quite some time. The good news is, in the 2008 Farm Bill, NCBA was actually able to get language put in there to allow these state inspected facilities to ship across state lines. So the rulemaking process is in full swing on that. Uh, we do have that in, in place. A lot of the uh, state inspection, uh, state inspected facilities are now in the process of getting their certifications and applying through the process, but hopefully we'll have some of those approved and going here before too long where a lot of these smaller plants, ones that have uh, either a regional brand or a lot of times provide some opportunities, local producers, can get across state lines. Because our perspective has always been, if it's safe enough to eat in Texas, it's safe enough to eat in New Mexico. Absolutely. And uh, that's something we have supported. And as a result of our efforts, we did get the language in to change that. Yeah, that that's great news and lots of great opportunities for producers, um, you know, just like Jim. We'll head out to the West Coast. I understand we have a call from California. Billy, are you there? Yes, I am. Go ahead, sir. Uh, Billy Mitchell, uh, fourth generation rancher here in the Mojave Desert. Uh, the issue about this berthalosis, I, I would like to, I don't care who answer it, answers it, uh, we have never had a case of that down here. We've had to vaccinate. And I wonder when we're going to make the state responsible for the animals that are carrying this. And I presume, and I, and I could be wrong, um, buffalo do carry this still. So if we don't solve it through those herds and these ranchers in the northern country that have these animals going, I mean, how can we resolve that issue? We are down here paying the price for it, and we have had no outbreak here whatsoever. Uh, whoever would like to answer that for me, I would love it. Yeah, maybe I'll give that to, to Bill. Obviously, you know, great, great question. We, we have a, a very healthy U.S. cattle herd here. And, and, and yes, there are some issues. You mentioned one in Montana. Uh, Billy's mentioning uh, one out there that really are less about our domestic herd, but they do have implications. How would you respond to Billy? Well, uh, the brucellosis is a tough issue because it is in the elk and the bison in Yellowstone Park. And there is absolutely no willingness on the part of the U.S. park or the uh, fish and game to eradicate the disease. So that is going to be a perpetual reservoir. So we're, unfortunately, we're going to have to live with brucellosis in this whole country because we do have that reservoir. Cattle are shipped around the country. Uh, we've had an outbreak in every state, Montana, Wyoming, and Idaho that border the park, and it's probably going to continue to have outbreaks on there. They have, APHIS has changed the regulations concerning the area around the park, and they have designated surveillance areas where they have different rules. They have uh, mandatory testing on a lot of those herds on an annual basis. You have to have a plan in place for how you're going to manage for the disease. And so uh, brucellosis is always going to be with us, and another one on a much more national basis is tuberculosis. There's another one that is contagious that we do need trace back on. Very good. Well, this is a great discussion that we've just begun. Please keep those calls coming. Our panelists are answering your questions again at 1-888-824-6688. We're also accepting questions via email. Just email us at c2c at beef.org. And it's a great time to join as a member of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. Give us a call now at 1-866-USA-BEEF. Stand up for the future of our industry and our way of life. We'll be right back. In that ring, buyers have an eye out for healthy, verified calves. Range Ready puts a document in hand, like a medical file for each animal that lets buyers know what they're getting, and most importantly, what they're not. So, go on thinking your word carries all the weight, but in the sale barn, your proof is on this paper. Go on now, take care of your cattle, and they'll take care of you. Hi there, I'm Joey. And I'm Rory, and welcome to our farm outside Nashville, Tennessee. When we go to work, whether it's on tour or here at home, we wear the West. That's right. Where it's that perfect snap shirt or that perfect pair of boots. When you wear Roper, you wear the West. Learn more about us, Joey and Rory, and about Roper Western wear at eroper.com. Telling the truth and being real and feeding my family a home-cooked meal that's important to me. That's important to me. And planting 
the garden and watching it grow. Everything's heating up at your John Deere dealer during the Green Fever sales event. You could win a $45,000 Ultimate Patio Makeover by Belgard, or a brand new Airstream trailer, or one of 50 iPads in the open air, open road sweepstakes. Get to the Green Fever sales event at your John Deere dealer today for a hot deal plus your chance to win big. No purchase necessary to enter or win. Sweepstakes ends February 29, 2012. See dealer or visit johndeere.com slash greenfever for official rules. I'm Kevin Oxter, host of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Join me Tuesday nights at 8.30 Eastern, right here on RFD TV. Thanks for joining us for this special live edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Join our industry's premier organization tonight. Give us a call at 1-866-USA-BEEF. There's some great reasons to join, including incentives from John Deere, Beringer Ingelheim Vet Medica, Cabela's, and Roper Stetson Apparel. Again, that number is 1-866-USA-BEEF. And we're continuing to take your questions on the animal disease traceability proposal. Give us a call and visit with our experts directly. The number is 1-888-824-6688 or, again, the email c2c at beef.org. Well, let's return to the callers, guys. We, we have the phone lines uh, lighting up tonight, and we have Mike from Mississippi. Mike, go ahead with your question. Thank you, sir. My question is uh, accountability to the people that are selling the beef, like in uh, sale barns and off their farm, if they know they have an infected herd, I bought a herd a few years ago that had lepto through a cell barn, and the people that were selling them had, were sitting right next to me, and I was never informed that they had an, an infected herd. Is this something that can hold the seller liable for infection, infectious herds? Should have had a lawyer on the panel, I guess, tonight. But, Bill, <laughs> give me your perspective to begin with and then uh, see if others have thoughts. Well, uh, number one, as Paul Harvey always says, self-government without self-discipline won't work. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we do have uh, a lot of people out there that maybe they don't know they have a disease and they sell it. Uh, one thing about this, uh, this proposal is it does give us a mechanism to follow that animal back. There's going to be, it's different from state to state, so what the re requirements are, as long as it fits the mold of the overall program of the United States, any state can do as they see fit. So I encourage everybody to call your state veterinarian to see what your requirements are. As far as the liability issues goes, uh, there's nothing in this about liability. Okay. Uh, I would say yeah. the liability issue as a whole, I think, goes both ways. In this example, uh, it's interesting on, on his position, buying that, those cattle from the guy right next to him, yeah. whereas an earlier caller had some concerns about what happens when a consumer gets sick. Would that provide the liability back on him if they trace it all the way back to the ranch? So I, I think there's two great examples of why we've really focused on this being all about animal disease traceability and trying to keep that producer liability away from it as much as possible. Yeah, very, very different than, uh, than a couple of years ago. Al from Ohio has a uh, call. Go ahead, Al. Yes, sir. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, I'm a private uh, small producer up here in northwest Ohio, mm -hmm. and uh, I, my cattle, my baby calves are sold basically the day they're born. Uh, I just feed them out. I have customers waiting. Uh, would the traceability uh, be of any benefit to me? Uh, so, I so, so just to clarify, you, you're, you're selling day-old calves, and your question is, 
is traceability, uh, is there any value to you uh, from, from a traceability standpoint? No, that's not quite no. the question. My question is, uh, I feed my cattle and the steers out, but uh, there's never any that goes off the farm. I don't sell them. Uh, uh, You're the selling directly barn. to a consumer. That's correct. So, so here's a guy that's calving the cows right there. They never leave his place. He feeds them out, uh, you know, harvests them, and sells them directly to the consumer. Uh, what, what is his? Go ahead, Colin. Well, I would say in regards to this particular proposal, the animal disease traceability proposal, he's not covered because it doesn't sound like any of his animals cross state lines. And that's a very important part of this system. If an animal does not cross a state line, it is not covered under this animal disease traceability proposal. Also, animals under 18, 18 months of age currently are not covered. That's going to be in a later phase. So those are two things where he would not be covered on this, but on a marketing side, I think that's, that's probably a different question depending on uh, what exactly he's doing. Yeah, let me follow. Let me follow up with that. But but that that you know, twelve-year-old cow that he sells, that somebody buys, and and then takes across state line to some sort of cow facility, that that would be that would be absolutely necessary. yes. If, over eighteen if, if months. It's, if it's over eighteen months and it crosses a state line, at that point in time, it's going to have to be identified okay. under this animal disease traceability proposal. Very good. We'll head to Arkansas. Fred, are you on the line? Uh, yes, sir. Thanks uh, for calling. Yeah, I was uh, interested in uh, w just exactly what are they calling a traceability program? Are they talking about having to have a vet come out and install the chips? Or are they talking like ear tags or what? Bill and Colin, you, you have, have, have gotten neck deep in this. Uh, lots of, and and, and you've, you've responded, I think, Colin, NCBA has responded to, to, to in, in the comment period. Give us some of the details about this program. You know, when you look at this program, uh, when it comes to the identifi identification devices, we're really pushing for the bright tags. The bright tags are official means of identification. They're mm -hmm. economical, and we think it goes in line with a lot of the programs that are already out there that producers utilize. That's really our focus. But we're also making sure that we have the use of as many devices or methods as possible. Uh, tattoos brands are not on their own recognized as official in this proposal. We're trying to work on that and our comments talked about that. But one key thing about this proposal is it is extremely flexible. The states have a lot of flexibility to decide what works for the producers within their jurisdiction. And so if a shipping state and a receiving state come to an agreement on what they're going to recognize as being official, then that will then uh, be, be accepted and recognized. So I think that flexibility will help us try to keep the costs down here. Bill. Uh, well, you know, I think there's a, one of the things about this ADT proposal that is superior to the old NAIS proposal is that it has uh, comments in it and has a lot more input from the industry. And I, that's going to be uh, important. As we work through this, there's going to be some bumps along the line. One of the things that we're concerned about is we want to make sure that this all works at the speed of commerce. Mm -hmm. We don't want to have to slow down commerce on a busy sale day in a sale barn and impede commerce. We want to make sure that it works at that speed. So we're going to have some things to work on, but uh, I ask that producers out there, as they see issues that come up, talk to your state veterinarian, uh, talk to us at NCBA, and we can work together to get that fixed. That's great. Great discussion, and keep your calls coming. I sure hope you'll join as a member of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association tonight as well. The number to call is 1-866-USA-BEEF. NCBA staff is looking forward to talk, taking your call and answering any questions you may have about joining the country's oldest and largest cattle organization. We'll be right back. These days, more cattlemen choose Draxon to fight BRD than any other brand. Here's why. It works, but we have uh, fewer uh, repulls and the ones that we do repull respond and we have fewer chronics in the end. To retreat anything is, it's a lot more expensive than using Draxon as the first time. And the evidence backs up what most cattlemen already know. Draxon cuts retreats by 50%. So talk to your veterinarian and check the online calculator at Draxon.com. You'll see why Draxon should be your first choice to fight BRD. Basically what it's allowed us to do with our operation is run more cattle through in a given period of time. It's just really been a good, good product to use. 
Do not use in female dairy cattle 20 months of age or older. Do not use in calves to be processed for veal. Draxon has a pre-slaughter withdrawal time of 18 days. Please visit Draxon.com or call 1-888-DRAXON for more information. Hi, I'm Kevin Oxner, host of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen and Colorado Rancher. Join me each week as the National Cattlemen's Beef Association brings you the latest updates in industry information and market news. Plus, each week we provide important educational information and features on cattlemen from across the country just like you. And we can't forget our favorite cowboy poet, Baxter Black. Join me for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen, debuting Tuesday nights at 8.30 Eastern right here on RFD TV. You're not responsible for the weather, just the cattle. And Rangeland works as hard as you do to deliver performance, production, and profitability. Cattle need consistent nutrition. They'll get it year-round with Rangeland products from Lando Lakes. Deliver what they need free choice in weather-resistant loose minerals and mineral and protein tubs. Get the most out of your forage. See your Lando Lakes co-op for products that will stand up to whatever Mother Nature throws at us. Weather's coming in. Rangeland. Consider it done. traceability pro proposal, we're taking your questions at 1-888-824-6688. Or you can email us again at c2c at beef.org. Now, before we begin, uh, we return, I should say, to our viewer questions, we want to tell you about some exciting educational and networking opportunities in store for those attending the 2012 Cattle Industry Annual Convention and NCBA Trade Show. Kendall? What can we look forward to at this year's NCBA convention? Thank you, Kevin. I'm with Kristen Torres of the NCBA convention staff. Kristen, when is the NCBA convention? The 2012 Cattle Industry Convention and Trade Show will be held February 1st through the 4th in Nashville, Tennessee. And what are some of the highlights of the program? Sure, we have a great highlight uh, plan for the event. We have a great lineup of speakers. Um, we have a whole lot of fun planned, including a honky-tonk party where we're going to be bringing downtown Nashville to the Grand Ole Opry. Um, we're going to have a Grand Ole Opry event on Friday night with Josh Turner. And then we have the largest trade show for the cattle industry, featuring the latest products and services for anyone in the cattle business. Now, I understand if cattlemen pick up the phone and join NCBA, they're eligible for some great discounts at this convention. That's right. If anyone joins between now and the convention, they'll receive $50 off their full registration, which includes a ticket to all of those great events that I mentioned earlier. Thank you, Kristen. And I would encourage all cattlemen to attend the Cattle Industry Convention in February in Nashville, Tennessee. Back to you, Kevin. Thanks, Kendall. I'm looking forward to seeing many of our friends there in Nashville and having a great time in Music City. Join the National Cattlemen's Beef Association today by calling 1-866-USA-BEEF. Join now and get $50 off your 2012 convention registration, plus a host of other benefits from some of our great corporate par partners. Okay, well, let's 
return to our topic for this evening. We've been having so many great calls. I, I did want to take a couple of, of email questions, and Brandon had emailed us. Uh, he's, he's emailing from North Carolina, said, if Japan increases uh, from 20 to 30 months, will age and source cattle still bring a premium? Similar to the, the question we had earlier in the show. Dan, why don't you take a crack at that? Thank you, Kevin. Yeah, um, I think the uh, situation internationally, and I'm going to look at it globally first, is that if we look at the export side of things uh, in this past year, over 15% of our beef production is being exported, and we're seeing a total value per head of over $200 a head attributable to exports. Mm. And uh, one of the misnomers is that when you say 15% of the product is exported, it's not across the board. There's certain products, uh, short ribs, short plates, beef livers, you know, 75, 80 percent of the of the products being exported that's attributable to that $200 a head. So it's all about value, as I mentioned earlier, and maximizing the value. So if you look at the traceability issue at hand here, especially in phase two of the proposed rule, uh, it has a definite impact globally. And that's where Japan comes in with the 20 month and down uh, program that's currently on the books, the NHTC uh, program for Europe non-hormone treated cattle. These are programs that work today in adding value. They're a form of, mini form of traceability, so to speak. And as far as going for 20 months to 30 months, uh, we, we do believe that there's impact there for a premium, uh, where we will still add value. Uh, if you look at this whole traceability issue globally, uh, we recently completed a study MEF did with Kansas State, uh, Colorado State, and Montana State that determined that we are a little bit behind as it relates to traceability versus vis-a-vis -vis our international competitors. Mm -hmm. And one that stands out is Australia has done a wonderful job of marketing their f the fact that they do have traceability uh, in Australia. Exactly. So these are the sorts of things we're up against. Yeah. But to answer the caller's questions, yeah. we definitely see value in, in even in at 20 to 30 months. That's yes. great. Carrie's calling us from Ohio. Let me go straight to Carrie. Go ahead. Hi. Um, I have a question as far as um, I know the Cattle Association has been very verbal in um, the slaughter of America's horses, and there was just recently some funds put back in for meat inspection. And I'm wondering how um, would your organization, I mean, how would they do a trace back for, for the slaughter horses? Do you have any idea on that or, or like a premise ID for that? Or? Colin, do you have any thoughts around that? You know, I have to be honest with you, I have not looked at the horse side of it. Yeah. really have been focused on what it does uh, uh, with cattle. Hmm. But yeah. you know, her point about getting the funding restored for horse processing inspection in this country was, uh, was a huge victory for our industry and our association, I think will go a long way in helping alleviate a lot of the pain and suffering that we're seeing from horses that are being abandoned right now. Yeah, no doubt. Let's go to the Northwest. Uh, we have an Idaho caller. Pat, go ahead with your call. Yes, my question is, when that animal's harvest, what happens to that ID tag, and what's preventing the harvester from if that animal was a low quality taking that tag and putting it on a higher quality animal okay so let me let me clarify so so um goes to the the the, the packing house and your question is what prevents that packer from taking a tag from from a a higher quality animal and putting it on a on a lower uh, attributing no. it to no, no vice versa vice versa taking what, what happens to that tag when that animal's harvested Okay. Mark, what happens to that what tag? What happens when that tag comes in, uh, we, we, we are mandated to read it. And, and we have to read it if it's a, a dangle tag, if it's an RFID tag, whatever tag comes in from that producer, uh, we would read that tag and we would transfer that information directly to the carcass. And then we would keep those tags in a sequential uh, number so that we could actually trace that tag back to that individual carcass. So. You know, we're mandated to take that information, and again, depending on if the cattle are in a program, if they're natural cattle, if they're NHTC cattle, if they're agent source verified cattle, uh, we'll transfer that tag and that information, and then store that tag, and we would transfer that directly to the carcass tag. Okay. Very good. Melvin is calling from Arizona. Melvin, what's your question? Melvin, you're there? Maybe not. Well, let's go to another one of our email questions. Um, Cindy, uh, I'm sorry, Ellen, I guess, from Wisconsin, um, asked the question about what does traceability do broadly for the export market? Mark, I'd, I'd turn that back to you. Well, traceability is, is 
probably been in the export market the longest. That's probably where it really started. And every country has some type of an, a traceability program. Korea's got a traceability program. Japan's got a traceability program. Japan's program is very important now with, with all of the, the catastrophe and, and, and the nuclear issues and things like that. So consumers in these countries have an ear for the traceability program. They may not be able to fully define it, mm. but uh, they know that traceability means something to them as far as their animal health and as far as the food that they eat. Plus, we see more people in international markets that want to know where their food's produced and where it comes from. And, and really, we have to have some kind of traceability program to do that. Very good. Josh is calling us from Kansas. Josh, what's your question tonight? Yes, uh, thanks for taking my call. My Absolutely. question is, what, uh, without making it mandatory, how are you going to implement this? ADT is, is a, is a uh, animal disease. It's not to sell meat. I mean, I, don't, I own a livestock market. And I mean, I can't get these people to cut their bulls. <laughs> How am I going to get him to put in here? Uh, that's a, it's a great question. You know, Bill, we have an industry with, what, 700 and some thousand producers, an average cowherd size of 30 and 40. How, how do you make people do this uh, without it being mandatory? Well, it uh, all goes down to each local state, and I think that's one of the components of this that's extremely important. It isn't a top-down system uh, from, the go from the government going down to everybody. It's work within each state. And that's really the key component is in involving the state veterinarian and making sure that they have a pro, uh, program in place that is going to be workable. And Colin, it's, it, it, it begin, if I understand correctly, this is a phase in program. This is, this is step one. And so right. they're starting with over 18-month-old cattle, only cattle are traveling interstate. G give us some perspective. It's, it's, not a, it's not a snap your fingers and we're done sort of deal, right? Exactly, because the concern was if this was a snap your fingers and have the entire program in place that we would have a lot of pushback. There's still a lot of producers in this country that don't want to have anything to do with this system. And when they see the government attached to it, that makes them even more leery. So this phasing approach we think is really good. What we learn in this first phase with everything over 18 months of age that's crossing state lines will help us make phase two even more successful. And once we can show the benefit of that, I think we'll see the market really start to drive this. And that's really the best case scenario and is where NCBA has been. Let's let the market drive this adoption and acceptance across the board. Well, we're in Denver tonight, and we have a call from Denver who lives in Oklahoma. Denver, you're confusing us. Go ahead. <laughs> Hello, Kevin. How are you tonight? Good, thank you. Good. I uh, appreciate all that you are doing. guys are doing there. I have a question for anyone on the panel there. Uh, my question is, if I'm marketing a healthy herd to the markets and uh, they leave uh, my place healthy, and then they mix with other cattle throughout the market and into the feed yards. On the traceability, where does it stop coming back? How do we trace that back to my ranch, uh, or does it stop in the feed yard or where we found this? So they were healthy when they left my ranch. They got commingled at a at a, at a you know livestock market, uh, commingled at a stalker or feed yard, and now all of a sudden they're tracing it back to me. When did what, 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 where does it begin and end, Bill? Well, it uh, it, it it starts uh, where the animal the disease is found, and it goes as far back as necessary. So, you know, hopefully, when the, if the system's functioning properly, it would. Uh, had note that that animal went through that feedlot and went through that sale barn and went, came from that ranch. And at that point, you can see uh, that footprint of where that animal got sick, where did it, could it possibly have, have got that disease. And that's one of the values of this, I think, is to uh, make sure that the innocent are innocent and make sure that the point of disease pickup is identified. I think that's a great point. We're not going to allow USDA to make this a gotcha system. And if they do, then NCBA is going to be the first group out there making sure we shut this down. But we don't get the impression that's going to be the case. I think Bill's exactly right. I think we're going to have uh, uh, professional investigation of what goes, what goes on. And once we find where the source is, that's where it'll stop. Yeah. Bill is calling us from Virginia. Bill, what's your question tonight? Yeah, my question is uh, reciprocity. Uh, the import of beef, uh, are there similar programs being instituted in, 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 in uh, Europe and, and everything to make this program uh, uh, universal? 
Mark, uh, your company uh, deals uh, with, uh, with, with uh, the beef industry, the poultry industry around the globe. What about this recipro recipro reciprocity? I got a tongue transplant. Reciprocity issue. Well, as Dan mentioned, I, I would say uh, we're somewhat behind in food and animal traceability. Uh, the Australians probably have the most robust system of traceability. Mm -hmm. uh, their system, of course, is mandatory, and it has been for quite some time. Um, the Canadians were working on a program. Uh, anybody that would be exporting meat to a country that requires traceability, uh, they will have a program and they will have to meet that program and that is their requirement. So uh, every country, regardless, uh, is working on traceability. It just depends on what stage of traceability they're in. What a great set of thoughtful questions. I wish we had a two-hour show. We thank you panelist members for a great discussion tonight. And remember, our staff is continuing to take your membership calls. Join NCBA today. Give us a call at 1-866-USA-BEEF. It's a great time to be part of the country's leading cattle industry organization. We'll be right back.